So we've all been there. You start out with the promise of a, of a new day, a reasonably curated to-do list, and a commitment and enthusiasm to make your art, and suddenly you look at the clock, and it's the end of the day, and all you got to show for the, you know, for the seven or eight hours is a bunch of little piles of unfinished good intentions. This happens to all of us. Whatever your skill level, it is super easy to get lost in the various tasks that go into making art, and for good reason. Not only is this, the art a series of complex tasks, but we're often performing the tasks in these chunks of time either stolen from other commitments or in the spaces between emotionally and physically expensive commitments. And that's why I'm excited to talk with Rob today, because he has tons of experience juggling commitments, yet just concluded an unbroken streak of daily posts on his blog, and I can't wait to compare notes with him about how we both think about prioritizing our work to make sure progress happens. Let's get started right now. Hello and welcome to the Lean Into Artcast Creative Work Chat episode. And this is where we explore a creative problem, things that come up as being visual storytellers, teaching artists, and learners. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist. And I'm Rob Stenzinger, a UX designer, interactive maker, and also teaching artist. Good to see you again, Rob. Good to um, see you, Jersey. So where did this topic come from? Why are we talking about prioritizing and finding focus and, you know... Never heard any of it. <laughs> yeah. This is alien territory to us. Uh, but actually, it came by way of a leaner who commented on one of our YouTube videos. And he said uh, it was on episode 352 where we talked about feeling overwhelmed. So appropriate. He says, hey guys, I'm having a problem with productivity of getting things done that have to do with prioritizing my day, including art. I haven't got much done because it's hard to focus when there's so many things that I can have to do during the day. Could you possibly discuss something about it on your show? I would really be appreciative. So that said, first of all, thank you for the comment. Uh, getting feedback from you about what is interesting to you and what you would like to hear us uh interact with is exceedingly useful. Um, I also want to say, I feel like this, the, the discussion we're going to have today plugs in pretty well or will plug in pretty well to episode 351, which is making your own time tracker, which is more about a week to week approach of prioritizing your stuff, but maybe step back and have a broader discussion about how we think about this and how we've engaged with it, how we failed at it too, right? Um, so... What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, it's it's an excellent, timeless topic. I mean, there are whole books and podcasts and tons of things uh, available to to help people ponder through this. And honestly, I, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, you know talking with you about that because I mean you you know you set us up so well in 351 about the the flow of a week, right? But then I think this feels more immediate. And mm. that's that, that stuck in a moment, which is, um, you know, it's a little different. Yeah, yeah. The, the, we talk a lot on this podcast about Dave Sreese's emergent task planner trademark. And the, the idea behind it is that you have three goals you set for the day, but you leave space for things to emerge as the day progresses. It's sort of like it's accepting the ambiguity of the day to day and leaving wiggle room for it. And I love that idea of accepting that and almost embracing it, saying like, here's the three things I want to do. Here's three more things that might come up. Probably will, because that's what happens. So like, I, I, I love the implicit suggestion of this is a manageable thing. This is something you can actually do. Um, and, and I feel like this is the kind of thing, the reason it's evergreen too for me is it's something that I'm continually attending to. I'm not, I don't set it at the top of the year and go like, okay, I don't have to think about it anymore. I've got my prioritization list done. I've got like my rubric on the wall there. And I can go like, is it this, this, or this? And then no, I'm not doing it. Or is it this, this, or this? Yes, then I'm doing it. Uh, I constantly go back and revise. And as a matter of fact, this year I'm playing with an idea of doing a quarterly check-in with myself. So we're entering our second quarter of the year. And I just had a you know two-hour meeting with myself looking at my time tracker for the year and said, okay, where did things fall off the plate? Where did things, where did the weak points happen? Where did I not meet my goals? 
where did I get bewildered? And when, when, where did I win? When did I, where did I succeed? Um, so let's, let's look again at what our commitments are for the, for the, the second quarter and make a hypothesis of how all this stuff is going to shake out in my, you know, weekly planner. So, hmm. um, and I don't know if you've ever played with Lisa Congdon's uh, time blocking. I mean, I, time blocking is a thing that I think lots of people talked about, but I saw a workshop with Lisa Congdon where she was talking about time blocking. I don't know if you're familiar like, with that idea. Not familiar with that specific um, example. So Lisa yeah. Congdon and time blocking. What's yeah, up with that? You can do a search for it. Lisa Congdon, time blocking. Um, she was also on the Creative Pep Talk podcast recently and talked a little bit about that. Uh, but it, it basically it's like trying to make your, some of your air bendy tasks more earth bendy. And for those who are new mm. to the podcast, you know, we, we describe earth bending tasks as things that require a full attention. So like what I'm doing right now with Rob is an earth bending task. I'm performing a podcast live with my friend and I can't be looking at my phone or answering emails while I'm doing that. <laughs> right. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know that the definition of a good podcast host is, is a malleable one. <laughs> so there might be other people who do do that. It's like, look, I'm just that busy. I'm like, okay. But er, air bending tasks are ones that can be done in flexible, discrete chunks. I'm going to put 30 minutes on it here, 20 minutes on it there. I'm going to do it in my car for a little while while I'm waiting for my wife to get out of work. That kind of idea. It's something that has a flexibility in terms of place, time, and the level of attention that you have to it. So every Saturday, I have a drawing session where I draw what I'm going to finish on my uh, now Tuesday live stream and I'm watching a movie while I do it, right? That's an air bending task because I don't have to give the drawing my absolute full attention. I'm multitasking as it were. So anyway, that's all to say is that Lisa Congdon's workshop was really about like, well, what happens if you say these two hours, I'm going to proclaim to myself that this is for that air bending task. I'm going to treat it more like an earth bending task, right? And it's something that she, even in her workshop, d described as that you check in on this constantly. You're constantly attending to it and saying, like, okay, well, that didn't work. So how can I adjust? How can I adapt to this thing? She really talks about adaptability a lot. Um, I guess that was really close to my interpretation of airbending already. So mm. if, I'm, if I'm getting it where um, I always thought airbending tasks, you know, floated in like a, maybe a bit of a flexible queue with... Uh, like kind of a group of these things need to get done. I don't know when, but in the moment, I was like, I can't remember, really, a couple few years back, we talked about like, I don't know, what is this stupid metaphor, but like picking a fight with your tasks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's like <laughs> being in the dojo, being in a training session and like which task will you engage first? But once you went, once I engage, I guess it is earth bending. This I'm in I this this is what I'm about right now. I is mm. is this task. But the the like the moments it wasn't it wasn't um you know intensely scheduled. It's it was um available and flexible for me to grab onto when the opportunity itself. Um and that's what I felt was the nature of the air bendiness where earth bending okay. is like that thing is scheduled, show up then and be there. And all that, uh, but I guess showing up and being there wasn't ne wasn't ever the a flexible thing. It's just a matter of part of the when and how. So yeah, I, I mean, interpretation. yeah, it sounds like we have like slightly modified interpretation of this. My my definition falls more into it's an interruptible task. I can be I can show up, me folks to do it, but if suddenly my phone rings or if like you know my wife calls, it's like I can I can attend to that, right? Um, and sure. and, yeah, pick and, it up and put it down. Right. Yep. Yep. So, so what I'm playing with this year, because and I'm going to be talking more about this when one of our ad spots today is I got a project that just got announced that I got to finish in 18 months. And I did a, actually a pretty thorough budget of how much time it's going to take me to do it based on a lot of experimentation. And mm. I need at least 10 hours a week at the very minimum. That's the absolute, I can't go any less than that per week to work on this in order to f finish the job. So I'm playing around with this idea of like, okay, these two hours, 
I'm actually putting them on my calendar so nobody else can book that time and I'm actually giving it to this task now. So it's an Airbendy task in that uh, it can be interrupted if life gets in the way, but I'm sort of like raising the stakes on the negotiation. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> so, yeah. The office door is closed. Pause before interrupting me. Make sure it's important because I need this time kind of thing. Whereas, whereas like, well, if I'm teaching a class, right, we don't want to be that guy who is on CNN and his child came in the room and revealed that, that man had a family. <laughs> Yes. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable. As, yeah, as, it's, an, as an aside, there was a Folgers commercial where there's like a woman in a, in a business meeting and like the kid keeps popping his head over his shoulder over. She keeps like holding her mug in front of his face. I'm like, what's the big deal? Like you have a family. We know this. We're all working from home. It's okay. Uh, that, yeah, it is weird and bleak. The, the kind of um, the sort of life work split in our and and it's i mean it's pointing to you know something that's essential in of our time yeah uh and it's it is weird and i know that um uh like yeah anyone having the whole aspects of their humanity show up in a professional context it's something that it's taken me time and practice to get used to as well and sort of question my assumptions with um you know having I don't know, having big emotions at work that are just about having a hard time and, and you know, being in meetings where people cry and uh, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, the reality of humanity is way more complex than the transactions that we choose to dedicate uh, chunks of our lives in order to have money to go to hospitals and eat and stuff. Anyway, but yeah, it, that, that and, and for people's bubbles to be that popped, I think it's, I think in part that that person I tried to filter it out, but over time you see that meme over and over. Yes. I think I'm guessing that person was a gruff grump um, wanting to live uh, in, in the, with his big world map. Like, look at me in my castle. <laughs> oh no, it's a child. <laughs> you know, my, my image is broken. Like, ah, whatever. Um, yeah. 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 You're, you're, a, you're a jerk and a dad. Whatever. <laughs> Well, he might have just been anxious too. We don't know, but I yeah, don't know. But yeah, Who yeah. I, think it, I could it, be wrong in that. I don't care. I'm a jerk and a dad. <laughs> it's about me too. I just, it's just, it, it's one of those perfect examples of like the thing that I think you and I rebel against in this world. So right, hence my, <laughs> hence my mini uh, tirade. But yeah. um, so. Aaron Polk is here. Uh, my dear friend Aaron, uh, he says, I, I'm feeling so personally attacked by this stream because we're talking about time blocking and you know prioritizing. And yes, I know Aaron is one of those people who has struggled with this a lot the same way I have historically. Aaron was there in the studio with me when we were working on the Warren Commission report. And there were days where we had to touch 18 pages of art at any given point in the day. And it was... Cool. It, it, you want to talk about encroaching on the rest of your life. It was like all I thought about. And I know I told the story on this podcast of like when I went to bed one night and I had my tablet in my arm and I was like moving my pen on the tablet while I was like half asleep. And Anne was like, are you drawing in your sleep? And I was like, huh? Huh? And I, I literally, I did not know I was doing it. Right. And it's like, she turned away. Laughing at that, but yes. <laughs> I, are you fill in the underscore blank in your sleep? And yeah, I've, I've been that I've vacuumed in my sleep. I have, you know, <laughs> um it's certainly drawn but like especially coding where i'm like hey uh oh, didn't i write this already and yeah you just sort of so hopefully notice that and then start to manage it which i think is tied into the uh like thematically this topic well i i think it point that those are the two ends of the, the extremes on this is like aaron is somebody who like ships like when Aaron says, I have this done by Thursday, it gets the, it's done by Thursday. And sometimes at great personal cost, I've been there. And I'm, I've been there personally myself, right? Um, and then the other extreme is, is like you get buffeted around by all these different forces in your life. And then suddenly you look around and you're like, I don't have anything like really recognizable to show for this time. And that is demoralizing. So on the one end, you got a demoralizing kind of end of the day. And the other end, you have an exhausting point of the day, neither of which point towards enthusiasm, health, and stick to you know? Uh, mm. So I thought it'd be worthwhile to dig into this idea of how we think about how to prioritize things to help make this more manageable. How have we succeeded in this in the past? Or what's our 
attitude towards it right now as we're experimenting with this. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit about stepping another step back. How do you identify what you want to give priority to? Uh, it sounds, this is always timely. <laughs> it's, this is never not a concern. Uh, there is no knowledge that is not power is, is the situation with this. Uh, <laughs> all right, that's a, that was one of, that's one of the screensaver quotes that goes in, uh, what was it? Mortal Kombat two. Anyway. Um, there's, uh, okay. So are, where, where do you want to go now? Um, so there's so I, many I, different possibilities dealing with, um, okay. Oh, so like the, you know, like getting focused on that, the funnel of like, where do you focus in general? Yeah. Yeah. Like how okay. do we determine what rises to the tops? Like this is more important than that so that we can say, cause I think part of prioritizing is learning how to say no to things. And I, that's another one that I'm really bad at. Uh, I am practicing it. I just said no to a fairly lucrative gig that would have been nice money, but I just don't have the space for it. And I had to say, I'm really sorry. Can I try? Can you please reach out to me again in the fall? I'd love to do it, but I can't, I can't in July. No, I can't, you know? Um, and it, and it's, it sucks. It sucks to have to say no to things that are exciting. Right. And that's why I, I wind up getting in over my head all the time is that it's really hard for me to say no to something that feels intellectually or intellectually exciting or very aligned with my principles and mission. So, Oh gosh. Yeah. Those are the worst. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's easy to say no to the, the things that are, I guess, you know, noise they're, they're in the way. I don't believe in that. I don't agree with it. I don't, you mm -hmm. know, it doesn't fit. Um, so I guess you can have, um, hopefully you self interview, and have some general idea about uh, like where you want to go. I think a useful self interview is one we've rolled out many, many, many times, right? Uh, like, so answer these questions. So um, <laughs> like, what do you love to do? What are the communities that you care about serving? Uh, what are tools and methods that you believe in? And what do you think is fair for like something you would call sustainable trade? Yep. And, and any one of those things th could, could easily cause a no. Um, yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Tools, and methods you you don't believe in. Um, well, yeah. If you know everyone has to sit around this table, um, twenty you know is is you, in unsustainable hours because we're crunching on a thing or whatever. It's like, hey, no. Um, is that <laughs> you know whatever? So that's tools and methods, and then you know obviously rate and um, but also yeah community where you're like, gosh, that sounds pretty cool, but. I don't know if I can also learn to like how I care a lot about, I don't know, kelp farming or so, I don't know, like whatever it is, right. Where you're like, yeah, that's just beyond, you know, uh, the space and I'm already full. Right. So mm -hmm. I don't know. that's, that's an example of saying um, stuff only gets to be invited here. If I, you know, think about these matters. Um, mm. What about, um, so you're well, thinking about other things like uh, capacity, stuff like that? Well, I'm thinking about capacity and I'm thinking about measuring how much I want to spend out of my capacity based on some pre-existing criteria or new criteria. So like when I think about, I, I had the experience exactly one time in my life and I will never do it again where I double booked myself. And I didn't realize I double booked myself until a week before the thing. Mm. And one person, one organization I booked myself with was somebody I had been working with for a long time, like for five something years. The other one was a brand new client. And so I had to decide, who do I honor in this situation? Do I honor the new client in the hope that it'll create more, you know, relationship revenue, building things together? Or do I honor the person who has been working consistently and in good faith with me for a long time? Um, so I think about that, like, okay, are there, were there any prior commitments with this organization? That, that becomes part of my determining factor. Do I have a good relationship with this oh, organization? Loyalty, right? What? I mean, yeah. Loyalty. Loyal loyalty. Yes. Yes. Loyalty b based on good faith interaction and aligned values and mission. I, I, I don't, my, my Not loyalty based on being under the boot of power, right? But like loyalty no. for love. Yes. Fear. Yes. My, 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 my loyalty is very expensive. Um, and I, then I, what 
<laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> yes. I love that. Yeah. Loyal your loyalty should be expensive. It is a very precious resource. And that it's 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 good to be proud of that. It's worthwhile. Um, that is a an powerful tool in this whole conversation, right? Yeah. And I don't I don't mean just expensive in terms of money. I mean it's expensive in terms of do you show do you show up with commitment along the same lines? And if and if you repeatedly don't, I'm going to summon the words of He Man from the Masters of the Universe said if they continue to make bad mistakes. You might want to think about whether you're not whether you want them for a friend or not. But many people do uh, learn the error of their ways. Everybody deserves a second chance. You get two, you get two. That that's <laughs> that anyway. Uh <laughs> uh but that also that's like awesome. I know that that was a mashup. That's Jersey and He-Man. I yes. assume that was yes. pure He-Man. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, and I think about, like, is there any clarity in terms of ship date? Is this something where I can measure it against my yearly capacity and say, like, okay, this is something that's going to take me three months to do, and then I don't have to do it anymore, right? Um, so other things can fill in the space. Or is this more ambiguous? Is this something where they want me to attend to it, or I want me to attend to it? For a really long time, is this a three-year thing? Is this a personal project that I'm going to work on for a, foreseeably indefinitely? Yeah, I have a um, I have a, cl a classification for this. Mm. Um, I I want it's you can observe is this situation an event or is this situation a lifestyle? Mm. And the the events have a containing a, more of a containment to them. Yes, lifestyle has a containment to it, but it's a whole lifetime and it's way more ambiguous and um the but like an event you can say like oh i'm working for a client or i'm an i'm an employee or i have a situation of my own doing or whatever because my independent business endeavors and oh this thing came up and it's a it's a real thing to deal with it's a new like do i add this on the pile but it's only here for a certain amount of time that's an event mm -hmm. and you can decide like oh we do need to crunch on this thing mm -hmm. um and you're like do we but if we, you know, <laughs> and if the answer is yes, anyway, yeah. It, but some place, some some uh, places, situations, habits are more lifestyle and ongoing. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it's and those are a big, big deal, is what I'm hearing too, right? I mean, lifestyle. Those that bigness is means cost. Yeah, so. yeah, and cost means a lot of things. Like that's something we keep talking about in this podcast. Is when we say cost, we're talking about emotional cost, like cost in terms of energy cost in terms of money that we could be making doing other things um i want you know i kind of want to talk about the situation like shift gears we're talking a lot about like people who freelance and take on work what about and maybe we take a break before we do this is what about the personal thing that you want to do after you've met all of your other commitments right because i think i'm in i'm inferring in that comment that inspired this episode that that was part of what was going on. It's like, I've got this thing that I really believe in and I just, whenever I attend to it, I just, I wind up with a lot of stuff that doesn't look like finished stuff. How do I prioritize this and how do I prioritize the tasks within the thing? Um, mm -hmm. That's what I'm inferring. And I think that, that might be a, a cool place to like explore like what it looks like for us when we're, um, you know, in the work session. How do we find that immediate focus? That's something you hinted at at the top of this one too, right? Mm -hmm. All right. I think that sounds awesome to pick back up and, okay. and dig into. All right. Sweet. All right. So we're going to take a little tiny break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about all those things that I described. Before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this project possible. And that is, those are the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Lena Tart is the website. It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in the work we're doing here, if we're, if this is helping you think and do useful creative work, you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on a regular basis. Dave Srise, hey, I just talked about you. Thank you, Dave Srise. Catherine Sugru, Kelly Ishikawa, Rachel Ross, Rachel Ross, and Ashley Knapp. And also, we recently launched the Lean Into Art Labs. It is a monthly 90-minute lab session in a place where we host a creative group of professionals developing their projects. The constraints give it meaning. It's a chance to show up, to share what you're working on and what might be blocking you, and we'll be there to encourage you and find new possibilities. It's also a place to work in the presence of others, whether you choose to share or just hang back. Each session, each session held on the third Wednesday of every month is facilitated by one of the two hosts of Lean Into Art, both Rob and I have decades of experience in teaching and facilitation and of creative groups and processes for all kinds of projects. 
and each session will be a unique one-time experience. Sign up to reserve your spot for the low introductory price of $10 per month through our Patreon, patreon.com slash Lena to art. If you're still wondering labs, what is that? Let's just put it this way. Do you need a place to show your work in progress? We can all use encouragement and feedback. Have you found the gentle creative project pressure of a due date or demo day useful? And sign up for the labs at patreon.com slash Lena to art. Thanks to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot. It really does. Thank you. Okay, I am going to play some music to get us to the next part because... Not, not like two middle-aged men dancing to uh, anime songs. <laughs> that That's what I you came here for. Someone, I know what we've arrived when there's a super cut. I want there to be <laughs> a big loop, but... I won't ask for it again. That's it. <laughs> you only asked once. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so this idea of like, what about personal work and when we're working on stuff? Because like you've got things that have clear deadlines in terms of guitar fretter, in terms of workshops that you've made. These aren't things where you're being contractually reached out by a client, You, but you put a due date or maybe sometimes the due date is externally imposed when like Apple says, hey, we changed everything again. You got to change your thing again. Isn't that fun? Apple's the best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, just like when we visit friends there and you go to someone else's house, there are rules and, uh, you know, sometimes you can't wear like pants made of knives at my house. I'm not, I, I'm saying don't do that, please. Mm -hmm. uh, so fair enough. It's Apple's house, but that comes up, right? Where it's like, oh no, uh, <laughs> I was working on other things and uh, my app will be nuked out of their universe if I don't do something. And yeah, that, that does create like a surprise deadline, mm -hmm. but I do try to have my own, um, you know, planned ahead deadlines based on like, well, roughly when do I think I can get this done? And among these other commitments and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, there's sort of a, um, a map of, well, it's, it's, it feel, it, it, it helps focus the, the, a work session, right. But it's not like what one work session's about. It's like, this is what I'm up to as a map of these different projects mm -hmm. with these different deadlines and priorities. So, um, like, yeah. And which is so, one, yeah. And you mentioned the whole, the, the daily shipping thing. Um, I wanted to turn, I wanted to turn down the heat in, in the, in the intensity of the daily shipping with all, all the other projects that aren't daily shipping. So, so yeah, I made more capacity by, by saying I'm only going to post once a week. <laughs> only. Um, but I did a 100 in a row of every day. So uh, I, yeah, I feel like I'm good yeah. uh, as far as that practice. Um, so I, I think nestled in there is something that I think is a um, sort of a perspective check to take with yourself on, I mean, is it perspective check? What am I thinking of? I think there's two kinds of skills at work when we're attending to our work throughout the day. At least for me, this is what I encounter. As I encounter things where I, I'm more highly practiced at it, so like when it comes to doing a quick sketch for a Baron Von Bear live stream or something like that, I don't have to, the leveling up isn't getting in the way, right? Then maybe there's a couple hiccups where it's like, ah, that's not what I wanted. Let me try again. But I'm not in the weeds. I'm not lost. Uh, uh, accomplishments or rather forward movement can easily be measured when it's something I've practiced a ton. But then there's skills that I'm using where I'm leveling up these skills, right? So this would be like, I'm updating my website with new software. I'm trying out a new plugin or uh, I'm messing around with like another OBS setup and or my job as a festival organizer. That is constant leveling up. That is constant. Like I thought I knew how to run a festival. Um, this is a big, complex boat. And I am working with a lot of personalities now. So... There's a lot of days where I feel like, did I, did I do stuff today? I put in a lot of hours, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so I feel like that's the quality of experience for me is like between those two things. Like there's skills where it's like, I feel like I'm in the weeds and F the um, result of effort is not immediately apparent to me. And then there's things where I have more skills developed. And this is something I can check off on a spreadsheet. Did I finish a page today? Yes. 
Pencils are done. Inks are done. Check. Right. And that that's a that measurement counts, like seeing the check marks happen in your spreadsheet or in like watching that pile of paper grow. That's not nothing. Right. So I think like it's the what what throws me is the ambiguity of when I'm working in skill high when I'm acquiring skill through the making of the thing. I wonder um, if if there is a different difference. Cool. Because. Um, because I'm hearing two, you're just, you're describing two things that I think, wait, Jersey's really good at both of those things. <laughs> so, um, it is the different difference, um, outcomes because the, the kind of, um, stuff that you can witness and observe after, um, putting in the effort, uh, is very different as far as um you know creative project output this is one of the things where why it um why it is such a big concern for me to be practicing other hats and roles where it's like i uh, you know creative process things for a variety of medium media i have down but then nurturing those projects as business endeavors is where i'm working more to grow right mm-hmm. and in part it's because of the tangibility and wh- how I'm wired because I love the clear output. I am, I feel satisfied and right in the world when I see a thing I made. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but then, the, but I think, but the output is, is one of the things I'm hearing what you're describing. That's really different. Yeah. Okay. That's that. I think that's, that's a better clarification of what I was trying to get at here is like, the measurable output or the visible output or the output that we are most accustomed to relating to is part of what makes certain jobs feel more pleasant than others. And I feel like the ambiguity, when we, when we face ambiguity with this, with these tasks, something that Aaron said in the chat earlier is like, if, if everything is equally important, then nothing is important. Therefore, how do you choose? Right. One of the factors of how do you choose is how, how naturally um, enticing and desirable does that task sound? Uh, mm-hmm. and, and the, the change in the world that you will bring about by engaging with that task, mm-hmm. like both, like, mm-hmm. I like the, how I like what happens. And phew, those are, those are easier tasks to just say, okay, I'm, I, heck, I, I don't have to ask. I'm already going, look at me go. I, this is what I do versus like, I don't always do that. <laughs> or I have to stop myself and then push myself to do this other thing. If I may yes and on that, there's also things that are super meaningful to me, but I feel an intense amount of anxiety before starting it. So for instance, sitting down to outline a story, I know I can do it. I have boatloads of evidence that I can do it. And I have enough evidence that when I've done it, it's like pretty good. Like I feel like, okay, I don't have a problem standing in front of this. This makes me happy. Yet... Every time it comes down time to start writing an outline, I am just stopped dead in my tracks by that resistance of like, and there's a lot of different rationale and reasoning that's going on in my brain of like why I shouldn't do it. And so I think sometimes even with things that I love doing, there's like an eat the frog kind of aspect to it to use that old, you know, chestnut. But like it's, it's the, but I would use a gentler version of, because first of all, I don't endorse eating animals, especially, you know, a live animal. Um, But there's this idea of just keep the pencil moving from Natalie Goldberg's writing down the bones. But also I've seen this in my classroom where I say like, they're like, I don't have any ideas. I don't know what to do. Oh, and then you see them getting really, they're getting wound up in their own anxiety. I'm like, just start throwing some lines down, put some lines on the paper. That part of your brain will activate and you will be, you'll get to flow, but you got to throw the lines down before you can get anywhere. And I think that getting over that hurdle feels sometimes like an eat the frog moment. This is an unpleasant thing that I got to do, but I got to do it in order to get that into that good place of making forward momentum on this thing. Does that make sense? Totally does. Yeah. There's a lot of different language surrounding, um, like how, um, well, I mean, you can deal with this at all ages and stages in life where let's say you're, um, you know, you either were a kid or you're raising a kid who was, who, who deals with the label of, um, you know, gifted and talented and it's Mm. super common to be, frozen in like what to do and not wanting to do and resisting because perfection is expected, right? If you expect yourself to continue to do whatever high level of performance, um, gosh, I even saw, um, 
is it Sandra Gorman, the poet laureate? Mm. I think um, that's right. I'll double check. And I, th- I th- um, I'm sorry if I got her name wrong. And the, um, let's see, some kind of you know tweet flowing by my feed or whatever, but mentioning the, um, well, sort of a now what? Amanda Success Gorman. One. Amanda Gorman. Amanda. Ah, thank you. Um, so someone, you know, very accomplished, um, you know, young adult, uh, you know, going, going, you know, bravely facing the next adventure, but then going, uh, feeling a little daunted. Right. And I think, yeah, past success is, is one of, is, is also, uh, baggage in a way. Yeah. Yeah, it really can be. And I, I, have, I know I've had students who are paralyzed by praise, right? They show up to my art class and where they came from, they were the gifted artist in their school. And suddenly they look around and there's 12 other kids and they're all good. And like, oh no, like I, I can't compete in this environment. And first of all, I have to go like, no, we're not competing. <laughs> we're supporting each other. That's rule one. We, we build each other up. We don't break each other down. But hmm. I've had like, like an actual intervention with some of these kids where I bring in my stuff from when I was a child. And I'm like, oh yeah, like here's some of my old stuff that like was really not that great. And you know, I didn't know how to make it better. And like one of the kids will point to a page and be like, that, but that page is awesome. I'm like, well, you know what? I showed that to a friend when I was really stuck on it and he gave me some great pointers. So sometimes showing your work to people means that you'll get to get good feedback. They'll make the work better. You know, um, I feel like I have to have that conversation with myself sometimes. <laughs> teacher jersey has to visit me (laughs) (laughs) that's that is the essence of this though because it's 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 a bit of metacognition and it's 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 the um, executive function yeah it's saying like in this massive stuff that you are and you're um including the story how your brain works and your whatever your neural reality um and, and just the you know being a human with a psychology accepting that and saying like i'm stuck and there's a thing i can do like even though i feel this i can do that and that that's a separation thing that that uh, i i found the only way i get through every day (laughs) because i'm just a jerk in my back of my head saying just unhelpful things and oh yeah um, yeah yeah I have, a, I have a friend who's actually put a name to his inner critic, and I think that's such a great way. Like it, he's turned it into a character that he has a conversation with. And I've tried to think about what is my what would my inner critic's name be, because I, I I listen to the quality of that person's voice, and I don't know what their gender is if they even have one. But it's like it has like this. Oh no! Oh, too bad. This is the moment where we find out that you're no good. You're failure at this thing after all. <laughs> you know, and hmm. I I I, I it, it almost it looked like. Well, his voice almost has the quality. I, I just called it a him, so I guess it's a male. It almost sounds like Andy Kindler. Like it has like a Andy Kindler kind of quality to his voice. I don't know why, because I love Andy Kindler's comedy. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, I, just moments ago, I realized my my inner critic critic is I oddly go. I'm pretty sure it's Ghostwriter. Wow, dude, that's yeah, intense. I just, I just was like, hey, who? who who I just looked back in 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 those dark corners and I thought it's a it's a skeleton it's a skeleton I don't know what I don't know what it is and all of a sudden it's I'm like oh crap it's on fire and it has a leather jacket it's mm-hmm. it's Ghost Rider <laughs> I'll just talk to Ghost Rider from now on <laughs> uh, Aaron's bringing up isn't that what Lucy Bellwood's One Thousand and One Demons is and yeah that's true like there's mm-hmm. the 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 demon dialogues that uh, Lucy published a couple years back which were like mm-hmm. very gentle and inclusive and welcoming conversations. Very like just like having a really gentle voice with this nasty little imp who just wants to upend everything that you're doing. So actually that'd be a good thing to go check out. Go uh, do a search for Lucy Bellwood's uh, demon dialogues, 1001 demon Di- dialogues. Um, and that'll give you like a template for engaging with that voice. Uh, can we also talk real briefly before we wrap up and maybe do a, a second spot? We are in a year right now where a lot of us have our capacities really stretched. Yes, a lot of us who are lucky enough to have jobs where we can work from home can work from home. But that's not to overlook the fact that we are now always around our families, our roommates, our partners in a way that we hadn't been previously. And 
while you and I made this very gentle yet um, uh, defiant comment about the guy who's too rigid about this is my workspace, children don't belong here. Um, that's not to take away the fact that you know those intrusions add up, and you were just constantly just like talk about loose knees on the boat. The boat's going like this all the time. You know, it's just rocking like left and right. You're like, okay, I'm keeping my loose knees, and it's been you know 13 months now. Um, so let's say you got like an hour, you got two hours, you've had a full day, you are wiped out, dude. How do you ramp up to get back to a creative space again, or do you? Um, yeah, there is no, there is no universal answer for this because yeah. everyone, um, how you meet that moment is your truth and whatever you're ready for, um, privileged, empowered, uh, you know, capable, whatever capacity you have, uh, like every bit of it, it's, you know, like this isn't about being prescriptive. Like you're the right answer could be take a nap. And, um, you know, so, so hopefully it's whatever's happening. You're doing some kind of thoughtful, nurturing combination of choices. And the, um, I totally understand and empathize with the desire to create, even though your butt is kicked. Um, like I could be, I, I just part of how I'm wired. I am not being bro. I am not flexing. I am saying that I care about making stuff so much. It, it hurts my heart when I don't sometimes. Yeah. And even if I'm doing other important stuff. So then it's, I'm just having a dialogue with myself. And then, uh, you know, like through that come up with, I come up with an answer that works for me. And, um, and if, you know, being the show that we are it's saying like, well, having a bias toward, uh, you know, maybe you're trying to find a way to, to reach for the creative endeavor, even though you're feeling a bit, uh, spent understandable, but worth thinking about because feelings that spent sucks. But if you're feeling that spent because you have other needs, those needs are probably more important, right? But if you're feeling that spent because of the stress about creativity and then, but you really do have an hour, you really could use this for that. Um, then it's kind of a, up to your own executive function and, you know, what works for you. Um, in one of the, um, with super, I don't know why, how availability heuristic it's like if you if you get a red bicycle you're going to see red bicycles everywhere um i just had a conversation like this with a friend of mine that um i was going to mention on next week's episode but um like i was interviewed by craig andera on his um get smarter and, and make make stuff and get smarter podcast hmm. and um it, something came up i've known craig for decades and uh something came up that i forgot that I think might have been a little bit of a seed somewhere in my brainscape about that affected two minute practice. There's something that Craig has would do for years when he was not taking on a project he wanted to do and he still, he could do it, but for some reason paralyzed, right? Not doing it. He started doing it one second at a time. He said, I'm going to go to the thing and one second is my commitment. And so like through that promise, like just get moving, right? And mm -hmm. saying, I can literally touch this project for one second or not, but my world is vastly different if I do this, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, one second becomes more and what have you, and you can build capacity. And this is literally something I'm going to mention in the, for sure, in the next podcast too. Wow. Yeah, I, um, yeah. I, I also think there's like, when you talk about executive function, there's like negotiations that we make with ourselves. Um, and there's ones that I make that are more broader long-term in terms of like, this is a 24 hour commitment I made. And then there's ones where it's like, this is, I'm making, I'm, I'm changing, <laughs> I'm altering the deal <laughs> with Lando Calrissian. <laughs> Pray I don't alter it any further. <laughs> um, totally. Because I try, I, I'm working at being more mindful of listening to my body and trying to feel like when I'm feeling something and if it's, if it's extreme enough, 
I don't mean extreme like Fred Sanford, Elizabeth, I'm coming for you, you know, coming to join you. I mean, extreme enough where it's like, I feel different. I feel different than I did a second ago. Why? And this literally happened two days ago. I was sitting at my desk and I was typing emails and I felt my heart racing. And oh, crap. You know, yeah, and and not like like where I felt like I was getting dizzy or lightheaded. It's just I felt I felt the the racing heart that you get when either you've been exercising or you're anxious. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I've been sitting here for two hours, and for my heart to be racing, I'm not in a good headspace. I'm not going to do good work. I'm not going to be thoughtful about how I attend to anything, whether it's drawing or whether it's emailing or whether it's you know doing some coding on a website. We're going for a walk. I'm like, but you know, then, then like, you know, uh, Andy Kindler comes in. It's like, but you can't go for a walk. Then you're a failure and you're wasting your time. You know? Yeah, I know, Andy. It's okay. I just named my character. It's Andy. I'm like, Andy, we're going for a walk and we're gonna breathe for 20 minutes. We're just like, I'll, I'll put a cap on it. I'm negotiating with you. I'm t I'm taking 20 minutes off of the plate that we had for this. I I think we need it so we can show up and do better work. We're gonna do more efficient work, more thoughtful work, and we're gonna be happier with the work if we show up with an open heart. And the only way we could do that right now is to go for a walk. So self-care, like Aaron's asking in there, um, you know, how do you prevent self-care from feeling like a waste of time? And I think that's part of the dialogue for me is like recognizing the fact that it's, yeah, it's about me. Absolutely. It's about me. That's why I gave myself a raise. You know, it's like, I, I care about me and like my health and my wellness, but also if Andy gets too vociferous about that, don't be selfish. I'm like, well, okay, but we'll do better work for people too. You know, there's multiple benefits to doing this. If you're so worried about everybody being mad at you, how about we take a break and then we can do better work? What do you say to that, Andy? Well, okay. You know, mm. so there's, you're demonstrating that whole conversation thing of mm -hmm. the, like someone like Andy or, or ghosty can take up so much space. They, they appear like the entire universe yeah. and they're not. And yeah. that's, that's the big, that's a huge acknowledgement is that this is not the entirety of all my, all things. And now I can include other things in saying that, well, I'm actually pretty sure if I attend to my, my fitness and my health and whatnot, I'm actually way better at doing this job. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where, um, you know, it's, it's almost like externalizing that, giving it a voice. Um, it's, you know, there's more to it than it's not, it's not just that simple, but you know, in a way, hopefully, honestly, you wouldn't let other people treat you like that either. Mm -hmm. And, and so giving it a voice becomes more of a dialogue where it's not like, Oh, this is me. And I'm telling my, no, it's Andy. Shut up, Andy. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. And then just and, slow down for a second. Cause look, there's more stuff to this matter. And, and, and while I was on the walk, I was like, I was like, Hey Andy, check out that birch tree. Isn't that pretty? springtime ah, ah, you're rubbing andy's face in it oh, <laughs> yeah. no. i was literally doing that the whole walk and i was breathing into the nose out through the mouth i'm like hey check it out hey whoa hey they got some really cool lights on their porch that would be that looks really cozy at night you know that kind of thing like really not trying to distract it like like life is beautiful or anything like that but more to say like no no we're going to be present for this we're going to be present for this and then when i go back we'll get back to that don't worry i've got this um and then there's another aspect to it, the longer term one that I hinted at, is I think of a line of dialogue from a C.S. Lewis book that I really love because I found so much utility in it, for it personally, is a character in one of his books is deciding on doing an impossible thing the next day. Tomorrow I have to do something that is so, and I mean, literally in the book, he has to fight Satan. It's like a, just a, a mortal man has to have a fist fight with Satan tomorrow. No weapons, and they're naked. So it's like, you're going to have a naked fist fight with Satan tomorrow. And, and he's going through all of the visions of what that battle is going to look like in his head. And then he says, in his, in, his, in, in his inner voice, he says, tomorrow you will have done this thing. And he said, he thought of like uh, all the unpleasant things he's ever had to do the night before. He says, tomorrow you will have done this thing. State it as a fact that's already happened. Tomorrow this will have happened, right? And mm -hmm. I found that to be really useful for making commitments to things. Like, for instance, when I started jogging six years ago, um, boy... I was not in shape, super not in shape. Like I remember telling you about it when I was first doing it. I was like, I, I really thought at times I was going to die. And, uh, but the night before I first did it, I said, tomorrow, by this time, you will have run at least for 10 minutes, you know? And then I did, and then I did it again, and then I did it again. So like, it's a little bit of that too. Like I make sort of concretizing those commitments the day before I find to be extremely useful, stated as a fact. 
Mm. That is, I mean, you're, you're fine. Again, you're acknowledging that you're made up of so many different things and concerns and matters and, you know, uh, ideas. So, because you've primed yourself like that's a, so you've, you've ethically primed yourself by doing that. Uh, priming is useful when you sit down to, uh, to address anything of if someone's facilitating like, Hey, welcome to gym class. Welcome, whatever we're going to do this. We're going to climb ropes and see that uh, and this. And then, you know, we're so describing what's ahead and just being factual about it is a kind of, um, yeah, it's a kind of priming. Um, yeah, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. And you're stripping away all the emotional, uh, context around that. This will have happened, you know? It's a fact. It's a thing, and it's okay. You're going to do that. Um, hmm. Well, you got to take one more break, and then wrap up our thoughts on this whole idea of prioritizing and, and managing all the big feelings around prioritizing. <laughs> no problem. Okay. <laughs> easy peasy. Couple sound bites. We're here. boom boom. Oh yeah. In in three minutes, we're gonna come back with the three things you need to know in order to, you know, quell that anxiety and go out there and. Crush the day, destroy the day, demolish it, put it under your boot and squish it to the ground, turn it into eat mush, it. eat it, then yeah. boom, who's the boss? <laughs> eat you're it, poop it out, eat it and poop it out. That's what you're going to do with your day. That's how awesome these tips are going to be. <laughs> Dang. Wow. All right. We are not going to follow up on that, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I thought I guessed it that and... <clears throat> <laughs> Extra far. But, um, honestly, who knows? Some folks might be like, hey, that's a business model. I'm going to go with that. Good for you. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah, Casey is, is, is in the chat. It's the Sergeant Slaughter approach. You're going to work till you wish you were dead and then keep going because you're afraid if you don't, I won't let you die. Oh, I love that line because it's pretend. It's pretend. That's why I like it. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah, pretend is fun. It's, yeah, you got to laugh at this stuff. <laughs> all right, we're gonna we're gonna come back in a couple minutes, um, conclude our thoughts on all this stuff, and then before we do that, we got to thank some other people who make this show possible. Uh, and those people are us. Uh, oh. We, yeah. Um, let me find my thing. Here we go. So, if this is helping you think and do great work, a great way you can support this project is by interacting with the stuff we make. And the thing that I make that I hope you will interact with is my new upcoming graphic novel, Baron Von Baer and the Case of the Two-Faced Statue, coming out in 2023 from Iron Circus Comics. Baron Von Baer, expert in the occult, never once wanted to be an adventurer, but when years of hard work are demolished along with an ancient stone guardian that rendered harmless his collection of dangerous magical objects, he will have to enter the fray at last, and he will learn to his dismay that those objects are not at all what he believed. So you can go to baronvonbear.com to join my Patreon for as little as a dollar uh, as little as a dollar a month or for free you can subscribe to my mailing list to get some exclusive looks at the process of making my next middle grade graphic novel. Uh, join me in the journey of making this book at baronvonbear.com. Woohoo. All right. That is awesome. And if you're, you're, if you still have, um, some, some support and love, you would like to, um, to, uh, you know, buy another product that it helps make this show happen and be nourished by it. Well, I have a workshop called listening like a coach, which is available at gum.co slash L L A C W S. And you might think, well, you know, I'm an artist. What, what do I have to do, you know, do with, with coaching? Well, do you, uh, well, do you ever advise other artists? Do you ever sort of teach or mentor or um, are in situations where peers are just asking you for advice on things that they're stuck with? Well, and in that process, would it feel better to just tell them what to do or to help them get unstuck in their own thinking? Well, that's what this workshop is all about. It's that process of coaching. It's a very learnable thing. It's got this, you'll learn really simple starter methods and advanced methods for coaching conversations. So if, um, you know, if any of that sounds really good to you, there's a variety of, of, um, levels to, to, to get this. You can get it as, um, a, well, a downloadable video workshop with, um, a PDF and, uh, of, of listening tips and worksheets to help you connect with how listening has helped you. And then you can actually do a Q and a call with me or just one-on-one -on -one, or me and your whole team. There's all these options available if at gum.co slash L L A C W S listening like a coach.
All right. So let's think about how we want to, like, are there any other things that we want to consider or wonder about before we wrap this one up, Rob? Hmm. Well, if we, if we revisit the question, just ask, well, how do we think that went? Hmm. So when you're prioritizing, prioritizing, prioritizing a day. So that's another granular loop to be like, Oh, I've got the big thing. And then, you know, th roughly this week, but then this day, doing that kind of quick conversation. That's, that's something allocating yourself, but then, um, the hard to focus when there's so many things that you have to do, right. Um, did we miss anything related to that? I, well, I just want to jump on some language that you threw in there. Cause this, this actually relates to our last mini workshop episode, opening up the analytic eye is evaluating what came before middle and after as a beginning framework for thinking about how to evaluate your day. So something I try to capture, and I'm not always successful at this. I'm actually probably only do it once a week, but I have a space in my day planner where I capture some, or have, I have an invitation to capture qualitative data. What good happened? Did anything good happen? And I also put critique in there, right? Oh, this, this, and this led to me only getting 30 minutes to work on this thing, right? But I try to at least once a week, do a reflection on how did the day go? How did it start? What happened during the thing? And what, how do I feel about it after it's done? And I try not to turn it into a hair shirt session where I'm, you know, castigating myself. You, you failed. You failed again, dummy. You know, I'm trying to say like, okay, just the way I would use analytic eye when I'm evaluating a Transformers episode, you know, what... How do I feel about like, like really like, like uh, using some language from say Hinduism, which is like, or Buddhism for that matter. It's like, I'm not my body. I'm the witness. What did you witness today as you were engaging with this thing? And can you talk about it in a factual way? And can that provide you with some data for evaluating how to approach it tomorrow? This is an incremental thing too, right? Um, I have, like I've said a bunch of times in this podcast, I have like eight or nine years worth of day planners that I've tracked like almost every day of my life or my work life in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can go back like five years and see places where I was like really stumbling in the dark and didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, you can watch the progression happen where it's like this used to take six hours, now it takes four hours. So that can also give you a really great tool for, um, you know, giving you some of that measurable growth because there's, there's, there's how you feel about it in the moment, and then there's how you feel about it when you step back and look at it, too. Yeah, witnessing growth isn't always um, a simple thing because it happens so incrementally, it, you know, day to day. You, you know, you experience a day and another day. But all of a sudden, this stuff accretes where you realize that, you know, yeah, I have sanded a whole ton of floors, painted a fence, waxed all these dang cars, and... You know what do i have for it but then mr miyagi walks up and is like all right show me sand the floor right and you're blocking you're blocking mm -hmm. a, a martial artist's punches and you yeah. didn't realize all that skill built up in you yeah which i think is a nice metaphor <laughs> well it's, but, it's 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 very it's on nice brand for us for sure what's that it's very on brand for us that's for sure <laughs> Fair enough. yes i love uh so karate kid metaphors uh aside it's you know, it's, it, it is an example of how um, you don't notice the stuff building up in you and then having some kind of moment to like, well, let me really look and, and see that that's, that's a really useful resource for you. It's, is um, so, you know, your, your, um, your journals are a possible source of some of essentially a, a Mr. Miyagi point of view. Mm, but mm, then, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, you also have, well, your past work and all that too. Um, that is good reminders to say like, well, I have finished these things. And th this is, this is my progression from just an output perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of ways to, to, to find that. Um, I, I wonder as far as, um, I was earlier in the pandemic, um, pretty puzzled about work schedule and timing and all that stuff because of taking on the role of, you know, uh, well, 
I have a more flexible schedule with my professional commitments, whereas my wife doesn't. So then I'm, you know, doing school day organizing support and, you know, um, all the meals and all this kind of stuff and, and, you know, house maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, pretty different kind of flow to my day. And I thought, you know, and, and what with sometimes we're unkind where we do stuff and we don't acknowledge it. So I wasn't fully acknowledging all the stuff I was doing and I wasn't noticing like where the, where the heck capacity was. So I, I actually used a spreadsheet and with 24 lines and said in 24 hours of a day, where is time? What, what can I do? And what kind of time exists in these different blocks? So you don't have to do that every day, but when you're looking, when you're facing a day with a bunch of stuff, if you acknowledge the stuff that is, you know, for sure going to block you, but then see, well, where is there space and, and try to make a deal with yourself to use the space if it's really there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's great. Yeah. If you're just connecting it and it's not there, then that's no fun. Well, no. And, and I'm reminded of another line from another writer that I admire, which was like hit, looking at history is like looking at the ocean. When you stand back, it's all smooth. Then you get close and you see the white caps. And when you're in it, you're trying not to drown. And you can't make good decisions about how to manage your schedule or your projects if you're only trying not to drown. And so it's worthwhile to step back and look at it from a broader perspective to sound not, not to be too end of the sitcom kind of, um, you know, blowhard uh platitude but but i i do think that like i doing i've benefited a lot from doing my quarterly check-in then doing the weekly check-in then the daily check-in looking at it from all those perspectives so that uh i can make more realistic answers to questions in terms of can you do this mm. those i mean those are really useful um cycles so if you're you're someone used to doing you know producing creative work, you know what tends to help. How much thinking do you need to do to accomplish an illustration or um, a, write a chapter or what have you? And uh, it's a certain cycle. And then in longer cycles, you finish bigger work. Well, you also have well the cycles of your um, you know career and life and where you're trying to go and all that. So if you're checking in at different granularities at different times, which is you know, something we've talked about quite a bit with, in, with the topic of goals and, and um, you know, doing uh, design sessions to pick the right thing to work on and all that stuff. Um, these are um, separate, useful, nourishing things. So, yeah, I, I mean, having, and, and I know a lot of folks will have a built-in approach, but if you think about it as, um, if you're stuck in the moment, you can, you know, make a promise to just work for one second, right? Or longer, 20 minutes is a useful chunk of time oftentimes, but then there's uh, well that day. Okay. That's another useful granularity. Then there's a week and month and, and, you know, all of these granularities don't have to matter all the time, but then they are pretty good, pretty good resources. And, uh, and honestly, I, I thought the 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 water metaphor was a, a was a more elegant way to say what I just said. <laughs> well, I'm glad, and and I just feel like uh, we if we coined another T-shirt in this episode, it is the word introspection. It needs to be just like right across the the, the chest, like in like the most broy font, like Gold's Gym, but just put introspection. We've been like hmm. somebody lifting up something or thinking hard on something, but whatever it is, but. <laughs> I feel like that's what we're really talking about a lot in this. A buff brain pumping introspection is, and, uh, <laughs> I'm starting to see, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Merchandise. Fo followed by eat it and poo it. Yeah. That, which is actually an Eddie Izzard oh. joke, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, that's an Eddie Izzard joke. But um, anyway, okay. Uh, so. Thanks, everybody, for downloading, listening, and watching. We'll be back in two weeks with another live stream. Um, please consider liking and subscribing to this video. If you aren't following us wherever you're watching us, please consider hitting follow, uh, telling a friend that this is meaningful to you, helps more people discover the show. The audio podcast appears at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash leanintoart. Until then, I've been Jersey Drozd of rss.jdrozd.com. Oh, nice. Well, and I'm Rob Stenzinger, and you can 
follow my work both at laneintoart.com and at interactive-storyteller.com. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.